Business Disability Forum, creating a disability smart world together. Hi, and welcome again to our podcast series, if you don't mind me asking. I'm Dan Cady, and as ever, I'm here with my co-host Lucy Ruck, and today we're going to be doing things slightly differently. Uh, for starters, um, this is going to be a two-parter, uh, as there's quite a lot to discuss on this subject. And uh, secondly, as uh, anyone watching will know, um, that we've actually got four of us here today um, on the podcast. So uh, the... The subject that we're going to be touching on uh, could be quite challenging for some of our audience. So just a bit of a trigger warning that, that we're going to be touching on grief in a number of situations um, but that will include uh, discussions around the loss of a child. Um, so sometimes the stories might well resonate with you um, and sometimes you might feel that like you've got a completely different perspective uh, to the ones that we're sharing, uh, which is absolutely fine. Uh, but we want to just highlight that at the beginning of the discussion. Thanks, Dan. And I was going to say that the topic of grief came about from some internal conversations we were having at BDF uh, with our colleagues and with some of the people in the room now who felt very strongly about it, uh, especially around those who'd acquired a disability and that term grief and how it fitted, because it's often something not used around disability. So we wanted to add some more context around it talk about what we'd experienced and what we continue to experience as well. And what we want to do today is just share that conversation with you. Uh, so this doesn't mean that we're going to be constantly <laughs> sad. Uh, grief is far more complex than that. But we wanted to explore the topic with you in more depth today. So we're going to just very quickly introduce our guest. So we've got Karen joining us today, Karen Snugs. Uh, for this session as Karen has experience of being a grief counsellor so is our little internal expert on this one but we're going to come to you to introduce yourself properly in a minute Karen and um, we're also uh, joined by Chantelle who's back today has already done a podcast with us uh, to be part of this conversation to cover it from a number of angles I think is, is fair to say Chantelle so uh, Chantelle as I've just touched on you've done one of these recordings with us before um, giving your personal story but for those that have missed that treat and want to go back and revisit it. But can you just give us a quick summary around your disability and, and touch on Bradley as well for us, please, too? Perfect. Thank you so much for having me back. Um, I will just get straight into the story. Um, so I broke my back in a car accident 14 years ago, and I've been a wheelchair user ever since that. I have managed to stand a little bit and walk a few steps, but it's more therapeutic than functional at all. But I can't feel from my waist down. So... I used to be very active. I used to do gymnastics, cheerleading, tumbling, and I've always had a really active lifestyle. So when I broke my back, it was a major loss in my life. Um, but 14 years ago, moved on. Two years later, I married my husband. We had, um, well, when I married him, he had three kids already, and we decided to start a family. I had Scarlett. She's 11. Um, and we after that, I had quadruplets, and it was eight years ago. And um, I won't share the whole story again, that's how we were born. So we could, you're more than welcome to watch the previous episode of the podcast. Uh, but they were born 26 and a half weeks at home. Uh, I didn't realize I was in labor when it happened. And it was a very, very traumatic experience. Uh, Bradley's umbilical cord snapped and we waited 45 minutes for the ambulance. And it was Gabriel, Bradley and Daniel that was born at home. And because Bradley's umbilical cord snapped, my dad managed to take him to, into the hospital. We arrived a few hours later when the, the um, ambulance eventually came, took us to hospital, and the doctor said, oh, there's another one. So before that, every time I went back to the gynecologist, they said, oh, there's another one. There's another one. There's another one. That happened three times. And so we didn't expect the fourth one. And then it became like a joke. So the day that um, Harvey was born in the hospital, it was quite a shock to all of us. Um, during that time, the first two weeks, we knew the doctor said it's going to be absolutely critical. But once you get over the two weeks mark, um, you know, the chances of survival is a little bit better. So 16 days later, we get a phone call from the doctor saying, you have to come now. So my husband and myself jumped into the car, raced down to the hospital, arrived there. It was a scene like Grey's Anatomy. You walked in with the doctor standing um, over his bed with loads of nurses, be busy doing CPR, doing absolutely everything they can. And at a stage, I just remember him looking at me and I knew that was done. Now we lost one of our warriors. 
So it was, a, you know, it was a quite a shock to all of us, even though we not expected it. We knew it was a you know, critical time, but, you know, like losing, still losing a child is really, really difficult. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, because that, that's not easy, is it? So and, and for summarising it, which is almost more painful, I'm sure, because it, it it deserves more. But thank you, Chantel. We really appreciate that. Yeah, thanks ever so much, Chantel. And and on that, I just wanted to bring Karen in. Um, so Karen, first of all, welcome to the series. And I, I know you'll be uh, dropping in with plenty of different insights as we carry on. But I wondered if you could, first of all, just give, give us a little bit of an idea of why, why this subject is uh, so important to you. Well, I think it's we've all gone through loss, haven't we? Um, I think that all of us at some stage in our life have experienced loss in very different ways. And I just think that people um, very often don't associate grief in the same way that we're going to be talking about it because they usually go straight to death and dying and the loss of somebody that you love or a lost a loved one or a friend whereas loss is actually a lot more than that and so is grief um my background before I came to work with BDF is um, that I was a registered general nurse for 30 years in the NHS and the first ward I worked on when I qualified was a respiratory ward and um of anybody that knows anything about medicine respiratory wards are one of the wards where you get a lot of death and dying, not just through um, things like end stage um, COPD uh, or emphysema, but also asthma. And um, and it's not just the elderly that die, it's the young. And I don't know why, but I have always been able to talk about death and dying. It's never been something that I shied away from even prior to becoming a nurse. Um, I see it as part of life cycle, but I appreciate how difficult it is for people to talk about it. And what I found was nurses, my colleagues would gravitate towards me and ask me to go and talk to their families of people that are either about to or have just passed away. And So I just decided this is ridiculous. One of us needs to be doing a bereavement counselling, you know, because I think I'm getting it right, but am I actually getting it right? And so um, I did um, bereavement counselling for nurses. So it was a post-registration training that I did. And I suppose it will be very similar to normal uh, bereavement counselling, but obviously it was very heavily weighted on patients and families. But what came out of that, and I hope this is what we're going to explore as we go through this particular series, is that um, when we talk about grief, um, it's not our perception of grief that's important. It's the other person's perception of grief and having to understand that. So if you imagine in the workplace, because let's be honest, that's what we're really talking about supporting colleagues in the workplace and um, nothing is not a one size fits all and somebody's loss of their pet who has been their salvation for and I genuinely mean their salvation dies um, this attitude of it's only a pet or it's only a cat or it's only a budgie so I want us to explore grief because Chantel's story is very emotive and Absolutely, it is. But actually, we're going to be talking about grief in a much broader sense as well. So um, and that's why it's really important to me, because I think it's a subject. It's one of what we call our taboo subjects that people don't like talking about for different reasons, but actually have to talk about. It's really important. Thank you so much. And you're, you're so right in that way of, again, how people will experience these things differently and and no matter what guidelines and what rules you might have yourself and how you feel about it it's it's totally different how someone else will be sort of like interacting with um, their own grief and their own their own circumstances Mm. I I was going to ask you another question Karen and you may be a chance or or maybe I'll fill in the gaps we when we were talking about this um off off but you know, before this, we were talking about grief is very different to different people, and it doesn't just go away yeah. because yeah. six weeks have passed or whatever yeah. time scale we think oh, we yeah. can put around that. And there's a really good analogy someone shared with me about a ball in a box and the sizes of those things. Do you, do you want to explain it, or shall I? I don't mind. Well, um, you can certainly talk about your analogy, but what I would say is that um, one of the things that I learned 
during the count the training I did, but also I've learned in my 66 years of life is that with all things, um, time is something that is different to everybody. Now, some people will experience loss, um, whatever that loss is, um, whether it be the loss of something physical, they've lost a prized possession or somebody has part, they love has died and they're never going to see them again. Um, our perceptions, individuals, as, um, as I said, and as Dan just mentioned, is that, um, oh, well, it's a year now. So should they be getting over it or it's 10 years? Well, can I just tell you, my father died when I was 12 and I still cry about the loss of my father. He is still my hero. And the time that has passed since he died hasn't improved that. In fact, if I'm perfectly honest, it's just made those feelings about him even stronger. And so when you're talking about your analogy, which I think is a really, really good one, I think what we should always think about is please put aside what you think you might do or what you think you might feel or how you think you'll react. Because in reality, you don't know. And the old saying, you can't know until you've walked in a man's shoes is never more apparent when we're talking about loss because mm -hmm. You might think, oh, I'd be over it in a hot second. Mm. Well, the reality of that is very, very different. Mm. And the analogy someone explained to me, and I might get this slightly wrong, so apologies if, if you've seen this somewhere else, but they were talking about they, they'd lost a parent, actually, at, at quite a young age, and they were they were in their late teens themselves. So obviously that that's really tough for anyone going through that. And they talked about grief being this box, and I'm, I'm quite a visual thinker, so I really liked this. It's why I wanted to share it. They said about it being a box, and at the beginning, you have a ball that fits in this box and it's almost the same size as the box. And anything, and if you think about the box being like your pain, the pain you feel when the box and the ball come into contact. And at the very beginning, it is all consuming. It is the only thing you can think about almost is that pain because it is touching the sides at all the time. Over time, as time progresses, the ball gradually gets smaller and you might think about it a little less it's touching the sides a little less often as it's bouncing around but every time it touches the sides of that box the pain is still the same the pain is not reduced that contact of the ball on the box is still the same and 30 40 50 years later that ball is still in that box and it might hit the sides a little less often but when it does that pain can be the same as it was on day one and for me it was just a really lovely visual example if that's the right word but you know what I, mean? I to me really have to explain what that grief can feel like mm. and, and I, I really quite liked that so I wanted to share that I might not have done it justice and there's probably a lovely video out there somewhere you can watch about <laughs> that but I just I just for me it sort of really resonated and I thought actually that kind of over time and it, the box and the ball are always there but it might hit a little less but it can still hurt and I think that was the key messages I kind of wanted yeah. to share oh, yeah. I think that's great actually yeah, I think there's certainly elements in that as well. And like, you know, similar to Karen, so I, I lost my dad but it's over 15 years ago now. But then even just on this last weekend, and it can sometimes be things that you can almost predict. So you have the anniversaries, you have certain moments, but just little things like now, just, you know, I've been to the football an awful lot since uh, since my dad passed away, but it was just at a game at the weekend. There's just little things where you think, oh, I just want to chat to dad about that. And it just comes about out of nowhere and you're you're thinking oh all oh right okay can't do that and you're taking that moment where you you know it it all hits you but the rest of life is just carrying on um i actually wanted to say because we're still sort of like talking about grief in that terms of loss and whether it's a you know, loss of loss of relative and lo loss of life but i, I know loose you you discussed your disability um previously on the on the podcast we, we, we've never shied away from talking about uh our own disabilities so one of the where, where where does this figure for you in terms of your 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 disability uh, in terms of grief yeah and it's I mean I think grief that this is why I'm so keen to do this because I think grief is such a good term to use which sort of sounds a bit wrong but it's kind of true so <laughs> For me, just as a quick recap, I uh, it's coming up to my 30-year ampuversary. It's an anniversary <laughs> of an amputation um, uh, in a couple of weeks' time. And um, 
I, for me, it because it was I basically I was hit by a train and that chopped my leg off and they found it half a mile up the track. So it was very dramatic. It happened very quickly. I was not, literally I didn't see it coming. Literally the train. Um, but it's that kind of for me. And again, I'm going to be showing my age here. But that sliding doors moment. If you've ever seen that film, what what happened to that other Lucy who didn't get hit by the train who maybe saw that coming? And what did her life turn out to be like? Um, and I think for me, it's that. Actually, I'm allowed to grieve that life I never had that I wasn't allowed to lead kind of thing. And I know that sounds silly because I was the one. It's quite complicated with the station, so I'm not going to go into that in detail now. Um, it's not quite as simple as it sounds, but I was the one who walked out and got hit by that train. But I, you know, if I could take that back and that didn't happen, I'd, I would love to have that life. Now, my life is pretty cool. I'm just going to say I love my life, actually. You know, I've got a wonderful husband, uh, two lovely boys and a, a very daft chocolate Labrador. So, you know, everything is pretty cool, but I can still grieve for that. And it still hits me at different times. Um, and I think it's still really hard at times. And actually, it was just a leg. It was just a leg that got chopped off. But that has huge implications. I mean, now 30 years on, the rest of my physical health is now struggling a bit more because the rest of my body has had to take the toll of that. So there's all those things and life I know is going to continue to get a bit more complicated as I age, which is obviously a delight to think about. But that grief of that life, um, I, I, that's valid. And I think that was the bit I kind of wanted to share from my own perspective. And I don't know what other... If you, and I don't know if this is just people who acquire disabilities. Um, I think it or or what. And Chantal, I don't know if you want to come in on this one at all. Yeah, listen. When you were just speaking, I could absolutely see myself as well. You always wonder about how my life would have been if I didn't have this disability. What would I have done? Because I had this in mind, and then something else happened. But like you just mentioned, um, you know, sometimes it's just not about the grief that you experience, but also the grief other people experience because of your loss. So you know, if your friends, your family, everybody else. The grief also have a effect on them. And I was just thinking about, you know, my kids, my my triplets quadruplets with three boys um mm. daniel uh, harvey and gabriel they all have profound cerebral palsy and i also grieve for them you know how would their life would have been if they didn't have a disability so you know it's like all these different stages of it is a loss it is a grief you know i want to go to the park i can't just jump in my car it's like a big you know it's always a big plan to go anywhere and you have to take care of with and it's just not as fun as you know having boys and put them in a the car and go quickly so I think you know like from a personal experience I can definitely see your sliding door moments and you know like you definitely grieve for some times when I can remember once like it really hit me it was months after my accident it was winter I think it was two winters down the line after my car accident and I was sitting on my bed and I wanted to get a jump out of my cupboard and I'll never forget that day because I sat up um, and I looked at my cupboard and everything was packed away and I couldn't get my own jump out of a cupboard and for me that was just like a realization you know everything is different mm. you have to plan different when you have a disability yeah um, I think your point, though, that you just mentioned there um, is so important um, about others grieving for you, others grieving with you, others not understanding your grief or your loss because they can't, but how they feel and how it makes them feel. And um, also the what if moments in your life, because one of the things that um it one instant incident I remember really clearly um, when I was nursing, um, and this is actually before I'd done my bereavement counselling. But someone, a young person, had died um, on the ward, and um, it always made us all feel very, very sad because a lot of the, these young people were recurring. You know, we were, we would call them our um, usual suspects they were always in in winter with their chest infections and mm. oh not you again get in and you know that kind of banter with them and um this young girl had died and she was in her 20s and absolutely her family were totally um devastated but there was two young girls that had come in and they were her friends um you know college friends school friends just friends and one of them turned to me and said but what about 
all the plans we made what about what we were going to do and what do I do now and this is a friend and this is somebody who obviously was very close and and it was what about me and here's the thing about grief when you're grieving somebody else's loss it is about you and it's when we grieve people that have passed away it's about how we feel we very often don't think about the person that's died feelings because they've died or the person that's lost like in Lucy's case a limb or in Chantel's case the sadness of losing your child or your mobility and your independence but we think about how that makes us feel and when we bring this back to being a manager for example and managing somebody it will be our feelings of grief and loss that will impact on how we then treat other people who may have want time off work or whatever it might be and I think it's a really interesting aspect of grief and loss that we but we do it generally our unconscious bias is weaves its way through all things and we as a team know that in this disability space this is a conversation we have that doesn't when we're not talking about grief but actually all the points that you've just touched on are so important to think about because we've got to start thinking about grief and loss as one and we've got to think about grief and loss as different to death and dying mm -hmm. and we have to put ourselves on the back burner because this isn't about us it's about somebody else and I think that's really important that if you leave with nothing else from this series and um, what we're discussing take that away with you that it's not about you it's about them and about how they feel and about how what they need and you know it's not sympathy that people need it's empathy and it's about support mm. yeah, and it, it yes. that really made me think as well about when I had my accident obviously it didn't just impact me I was 17 at the time you know my parents I think I've got a 14 year old is just come home from school now and you know it's like that's three years time you know as a parent to go through that as you know as you have with the loss of a child Chantal but anything that there's that parental guilt is like a, I mean that that that's a, a grief all of its own isn't it I think but it, it it is that kind of stuff and you think oh what they went through was really hard and I know that at the time my dad was told just take time off do what you need to do be with Lucy and then a few months later they forgot and they were like well, you've used up all your holiday <laughs> it's like no I, didn't, I was at my daughter's hospital bed and it's that sort of stuff it's that supportive employer side of things and actually the other thing was is um my granddad we didn't he was uh, he died a year after my accident but he was around at the time and he didn't know what to do and it's that sense of helplessness I think for others that they can't fix it they can't control it they can't do anything and that is their form of grief of that lack of control around it and it wasn't until after he'd, he'd passed away that um we found out how upset he was because we he just he was a man who didn't share you know he fought in wars and stuff and but it was that helplessness I think and that stuff is is really sad but it, it the, the wider impact to something like that happening is massive it's that ripple effect isn't it mm. yeah massively there's something else that you mentioned in there when you talking about your your experience as well Lucy around talking about being upset and being allowed to upset, be allowed to upset, be upset, um, allowing yourself to have that, uh, you know, 30 years on as well. And I think that's something we get when we talk around uh, disability and grief. And again, this comes back to other people's perceptions as well, where it's all right to be sad and upset without it then being, we get into these um, little bits of language. And I think this is where it particularly gets tricky for managers as well who are thinking well I've been told everything positive around disability if you like and then you know to actually admit that they, oh, they might actually need be some more support that an individual needs and when we get this in just an example I used to work for a um, awesome charity and I remember we had a couple of people doing a, an interview and and they were parents of autistic children. One of them did say during the interview that, you know, when they found out their child was autistic, they were upset. And that really split an audience because it was almost this expectation. There's got to be a binary, what's wrong and what's right. Oh, you can't 
you can't be um, grieving or remorseful that your your child's autistic, but you know for whatever reason that person has for the fact that they're going to need more support or for their own expectations, as Karen was saying, of how this child's life was going to be, they then find themselves sort of like having to change for themselves, and so it does then come back to the individual. Um, but I, I suppose that also leads on to when when we're thinking about someone who's sort of acquired a disability, someone who sort of acquires a disability while they're in the workplace. And, uh, you know, we, we have these expectations and sort of we often think of focus on like, you know, healing or um, physio and sort of elements maybe of counselling. But, but, but there is so much more that goes on in terms of sort of like, you know, mental health and emotional states. Um, I wonder if anyone wanted to come in on, on that, whether that's a, their own experience or again, Karen, your, your experience of, again, those, those, those other challenges that people may well have. Well, interestingly, I would say that recently I've acquired a disability or I've acquired something that is um, causing me um, to be disabled, I would suggest. It may be a temporary um, thing, which we're all hoping for, but I'm 66 and you get older and things are harder to heal and improve. And so I have to be realistic. Um, but what I would say is, we find ourselves incredibly lucky because we work for BDF. So every level of support that we need. So my emotional well-being, and Lucy will testify to this, where I've just started to cry because I was, you know, incredibly affected by um, my body image because that's a loss and my lack of being able to do what I used to do. Daniel, going to football. Can you imagine? I couldn't go to watch my beloved Chelsea because I can't sit down in the seats. That is a huge loss for me. And some yes. people might think that's flippant, but I've been going for over 50 years to football and it's it's a massive loss. Of course, I don't cry about it. I cry when they lose a game, obviously, but I <laughs> think that... When we're thinking about these things, it's really important that we, we've we got an ageing workforce. Most organisations have an ageing workforce. The um, average age to acquire disability is 54. So then you start thinking about a very different dynamic. But the mental health aspect or mental well-being, I have never considered myself to be vulnerable to that because of the nature of the work that I've done and, you know, um, just my life experiences. But I actually found my mental health being affected by my immobility and by, um, and I, I've talked about this, so I'm not embarrassed to talk about it, but weight gain, massive weight gain, because I couldn't walk, I couldn't go anywhere, I couldn't do anything. Incredibly difficult to deal with all of those things. And um, is that loss? Is that grief? Well, it might not be in some people's typical ideas, but this is what we're talking about and trying to be understanding of those issues. I mean, of course, my workplace that I work with have been understanding about all aspects of what's been going on. I've been able to tell them of what's been going on. But can everybody that's listening to this, could anybody go to their manager and say, do you know what, I've put on two stone and do you know what that, how that's affecting me? Or I can't get up and down the stairs like I used to. They're saying, well, can you sit at your desk? Can you tap on your, you know, I, I'm being flippant, but you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. think that, again, some of the takeaways that I hope people get from us sharing our lived experience and talking about this in a very different way is to think about this in a very different way and to actually treat people holistically and as individuals. Because one of the things that we know, because we deal with it all the time, is this one size fits all approach to everything so somebody has got a visual impairment oh I know what they need this is the adjustment they need uh well no that doesn't work for that individual uh, and it's the same with grief you know how somebody might have worked with Lucy had Lucy have been in the workplace when her accident happened um would be very different to how they might have dealt with a Chantel how they might have dealt with me and my issues but the reality is we've all got very different and complex needs and so therefore we need to be treated differently and 
holistically and grief is no less important than somebody that needs a rise and fall desk or a screen reader and again some people might think I'm um being flippant I'm not I'm being deadly serious this is something that we need to be thinking about in the same ways that we think about all things to do with our workforce and our employees mm -hmm. that's if it is oh go on Shantan Sorry, Dan. So on that, I was just thinking about my personal experience. So when after I broke my back, I also had to change my job because I lost my job. So it was not just a loss of, you know, the physical that I can't do anymore. I used to love going clubbing <laughs> and I couldn't do that anymore because I didn't want to be the one that my friends have to worry about getting my wheelchair in and out the, um, you know, in the car. So I didn't want to do things like that anymore. But then on top of that, I also lost my job, but I studied for seven years to become. And it was like really, really tough and I like you know like looking back now I wish I hope that it, like there was better um understanding like we have you know that's why we do what we do to help companies coach them how to make the right decisions to keep people in employment so when something like this happens to them it's not just you know disability that causes loss and but so they can actually stay in the room that's also doing and you know the other thing as well is it's um closing your eyes if you can't see it you don't need to deal with it so that's something else that i think is really important when we're talking about grief and loss people feel uncomfortable talking about it whether it's because you're an emotional soul and you you might get upset even though it's not somebody you know or uh, etc or it's because you're a cold-hearted devil who doesn't care all you care about is the bottom line you know and everything in between but there is this thing about um I saw it so often when I was nursing, um, non-acceptance, you know, I'm telling somebody your loved one is going to die. You need, no, no, they're not. Just give them some more fluids. Can't you just up the dose of paracetamol or whatever it might be? No, no. The, you know, this, um, finding it very difficult to accept denial and I think it's um, this might be a good opportunity to just talk about the stages of grief slightly, although they do change and they're not all the same for everybody. But there are stages of grief. And what's important about the stages of grief, whether you're at the acceptance, denial, anger or whatever it is, you don't stay at them necessarily and then just move on to the next stage because that's what the stages of grief say. You can be in denial and then acceptance and then go back to denial. You can get through anger and go on to the next stage and then come back and be more furious than you were the first time round. And all of those things are things that employers, when they're managing people that are going through loss, whatever it is, um, don't necessarily understand and don't necessarily discuss because they close their eyes and they think it's not there because they can't see it. And I think that's something else that, I mean, Lucy and um, Chantelle, you may have experienced that in with your um, disabilities and working in different in, in, with different employers, how they have managed that with you. We've had so much to say today. We're going to split this across two podcasts. So uh, please come back and tune in for the next episode where we're going to be continuing this conversation. Thank you. Thank you for listening. You can find future episodes on major streaming platforms, search Business Disability Forum or at businessdisabilityforum.org.uk and search podcasts. You can also watch the series on our YouTube channel, search for Business Disability Forum. Please do share and leave us a rating. Business Disability Forum is the leading business membership organisation in disability inclusion. We work in partnership with business, government and disabled people to remove barriers to inclusion. Businessdisabilityforum.org.uk